Welcome and thank you for joining us today for this session regarding control value. I, uh, I think this will hopefully open your eyes to some new things, but uh, let's dive in and see if that's true. So I like to start these kinds of presentations with questions just to plant seeds in your mind. And the first question is fairly straightforward, one would think. What's the most valuable control in your cybersecurity program? And then what's the least valuable control? And then here's an interesting question. Would your answers be the same as someone else in your organization? Now, my experience in asking these questions is that while some people will put forth an answer to the first question, you know, with, sometimes with confidence, um, very often they're hesitant to answer the second one at all. And then this third question, would their answer be the same? Well, obviously, that's, that's very unlikely in my experience. I haven't, I haven't seen, any, any, seen any evidence of that yet, okay? But the question is, why are these so difficult to answer? You would think as a profession who spends an incredible amount of time on controls that we would be able to answer these questions with some confidence, but we aren't. You know, I have not encountered a soul, a single person where I've posed these questions where they could not only with confidence answer them, but also explain their answers in ways that really stood up. Okay. But, but there's a reason for that. And that's what this is about today. So if we look at this diagram here, and the vertical axis is how much risk an organization has, and the horizontal axis is how much money they're spending on trying to manage their, their risk. And let's say they're spending that amount, of, that amount of money and they're getting that much reduction. That doesn't look bad, I guess, you know, relative, you know, on that curve. But what if for the same amount of money, they could drive down risk to there? Well, I think it should be pretty clear that, you know, we would rather drive down more risk for the same cost. And that begs the question, what, what's driving that difference? And the difference is really this. We need to understand what levers to pull from control perspective and in what order, because order sometimes matters um, to achieve the organization's risk management objectives. And in knowing which levers to pull and what we're getting for that, those actions, those decisions, is really where we struggle as a profession, at least to be consistent. But again, there's a reason for that. First, we have to define what we mean by value. And, and the definition that I found to work and, and, and stand up under, under close scrutiny is this. It, you know, the value of any control boils down to how much risk it reduces, either directly or indirectly. And we'll get into that more in a minute. But here's essentially the definition of value that I found to work really effectively. And if that's true, then, then we can ask ourselves, back to those initial questions, we can ask ourselves, well, if, if we understand value to be how much risk is reduced, then we should be able to look at a control like this from ISO and say, all right, here's how much less risk we have. But again, I haven't found anybody who's been able to do that in a way that stands up. And there's more to this. So let's use an analogy to drive the point home. So if you're a physician or looking at medicine as a professional practice, which is more important? Is it anatomy or physiology? Well, neither. You need both. You need to know the parts of the system, the bones, the muscles, the blood vessels, the different organs and whatnot. But you also need to know how those components work both individually and as a system, okay? And that's what's been missing for us as a, as a profession. So we have, you know, if we look at, again, to extend this, this, this medical analogy, we can look at the spleen and we can say, all right, we know roughly where it should sit in the, in the body and what it should look like, you know, sort of the characteristics of it. And we can infer even the role it serves because, hey, maybe we've seen over the years that people with a dysfunctional or missing spleen are more prone to infection, right? So we say, well, it must have a role in the immune system, but that doesn't mean we know how it works. 
if we look at the physiology, we can understand that it filters blood via two things called white pulp and red pulp. I'm not going to get into the details there, but that's how it's doing this, how it's supporting the immune system. But it's also dependent on arteries and veins and nerves and et cetera that make up the rest of the system. And there are parts of the system too that are highly dependent upon this performing its function well, right? Anything that is susceptible to infection, which is pretty much everything, depends on the spleen to some degree. The good news is if it's dysfunctional or missing in some fashion, the other parts of the system that can to some degree make up for it. And my point here is that it is part of a system. We, even if we understand how it works independently, you know, just within its own boundaries, so to speak, that's still not enough to practice medicine by. We have to understand the bigger picture, the systemic effects both upstream and downstream from this, from this component or this anatomical part. Now, if we look at cybersecurity, again, back to sort of this awareness training uh, element, we can say anatomically, we know sort of the, the, the things that are oftentimes contained within, within it, you know, maybe how often it's, it's given, and we can infer or, or, or suspect what, you know, what its benefits are and the purpose, if you will. But if we want to look at it from a physiology perspective, then we need to understand that it's communicating expectations and improved methods to, to personnel. But it's dependent upon things upstream from it. It depends upon, hey, the policies that it's communicating. Have they been defined? Are they the right policies? Risk appetite that drives maybe how often awareness training takes place, what the expectations are in terms of pass fail rate. We have to also, or there's dependence beyond risk measurement, again, to know how much this matters, which drives how often it should take place, uh, what should be an acceptable pass fail rate and those sorts of things. So there are all these things upstream from it that this de is dependent upon to really serve its purpose well. But then there are the things downstream of, from it that depend upon it to be working well. And that is things like authentication, because after all, what's the easiest way to get a password? You have fish for it, okay? Or to get into, you know, compromise an endpoint, phishing, these sorts of things. So there are all these other components in the risk landscape that are dependent upon this working well. The good news, however, is that in some cases, uh, deficiency in awareness training may be partially compensated for by other controls. Again, the bottom line here is that this thing works as part of a larger system. And if we want to understand how much of this matters, we have to understand how well the rest of the system is working, the things upstream that this is dependent upon, and the things, the compensating controls perhaps, that uh, would make up for a weakness here. And again, from my perspective, um, my argument is that as a profession, we have these control frameworks, the ISO and the CSF and 853 and PCI DSS and the um, CIS top 20 and um, high trust, these control frameworks are anatomy, they're incredibly important, incredibly useful, but they're anatomy. They don't get into physiology in any meaningful way. And as a result, we, the practitioner, have to essentially through our intuition and experience, fill in the gaps for physiology. And the more I've gotten into this whole notion of controls physiology and really dug into it to try and understand it, the more I've realized that in almost 40, year, 40 years of practice in this profession, I was missing a whole lot. I, my, my understanding of the system, the physiology was really incomplete and, and inconsistent. And, and, you know, I'm not going to make the claim that I'm the, the best practitioner in the world. I'm sure I'm not. But I, I can confidently say that because our profession hasn't focused on this dimension of our problem, you know, the vast majority of people in our profession, the vast majority, likewise have an incomplete and 
and very often um, incorrect interpretation or understanding of this notion of physiology. And it's just never been formally defined, which is what I'm here to try to begin to fix. So I've been for years now working on trying to understand controls from an analytic performance perspective. And I've come up with what I'm referring to as the FAIR controls now analytics model or FAIR cam. And that's what I'm introducing here today. <clears throat> and the ob objectives really are to enable reliable measurement of control value and efficacy so that we can be making better decisions and better use of our resources, our limited resources. Um, be able to validate control efficacy because we might believe one thing, but hey, how about validating it empirically? And again, that's one of the criteria I set for myself in developing this is, you know, the elements in this have to uh, support empirical validation. Um, it has to account for both the individual functions of a control, as well as the systemic functions of the control landscape. And all of this then helps us to better use the telemetry that we have. But it also um, has pointed out to me that much of the telemetry we have isn't the, the telemetry we need. So this can help us to identify opportunities from a security telemetry perspective. And um, and certainly far better apply the telemetry we have. You know, I know there are technologies today that, that you know, are, are doing risk measurement automatically, you know, by taking telemetry data. And, and, I, and I promise you, I, I absolutely guarantee you they haven't got it right. Um, and unless they've developed this as well and simply haven't, haven't shared it, that's always a possibility. But again, from everything I've seen, I, I have no expectation that that's the case. Now I need to, speaking of expectations, I, I wanna set some expectations now because I continually get hammered by people telling me, oh, we need to make it simpler, we need to make it simpler. And I get that, I, you know, I like things simple too, but, but we have to remember, modern medicine isn't complex because the doctors got all nerdy. All right, it's complex because human pathology and physiology is inherently complex. And, and if we want to manage our problem space, which is also really complex, if we want to manage it effectively, if we want to have our own form of effective medicine, then we have to understand it deeply. We have to understand these complexities and these subtleties and nuances that you know exist in a, in a system like this. And there simply isn't an easy button for security. As, as much as we might wish otherwise, there just isn't one. And that isn't to say that, that we can't, once we understand things deeply, we understand the complexity and the nuances and subtleties, from there we can simplify, we can make informed choices towards simplification without losing efficacy. We can develop our, our version of field medicine, if you will, right? The medics in, in medicine, field medics, they're practicing simpler diagnostics and simpler treatments, but those simplicities are based on a deeper understanding, right? If, if you don't have that deeper understanding, what you end up with is blood bloodletting, you know, and shamanism. And and that's just not where we need to be as a, as a profession. So we need to understand it deeply and from there, find ways to simplify it. And I've already in developing this and working with it, begun to see opportunities there. But again, don't be put off by the fact that this is more complex than what we're used to. Well, our problem space is just simply complex. And I love this quote um, from Einstein. Uh, Oddly enough, he didn't exactly say this. His sentence was, ironically enough, way more complicated than this. This is a boiled down version of his sentence, but I'll, I'll leave that to you to look up if you're interested. But the premise is absolutely true. So let's clarify a couple of terms before we go any further. So threats and asset combined create risk for us. So we put controls in place. To, to manage the frequency and man, magnitude of loss. And that's, 
That's what controls are. They're anything that directly or indirectly affect the frequency or magnitude of loss. And that's a fairly broad brush, but there's a reason for that. And again, we won't be able to get into some of the reasons for that broad brush here today simply because of time constraints. But you know, this, this definition is what it is for what I believe to be very good reasons. And some examples are the kinds of things we're used to in our profession, right? These are the things we live and breathe day in and day out. Control functions are how controls affect the frequency or magnitude of loss. And here's some examples. Now, wait a minute. Some of you are going to be saying, hey, we've been using these terms forever. So we are doing physiology. Mm, let's look at that a little more closely. Um, so let's look at the control functions as design or defined by NIST CSF, right? Yeah, they identify, prevent, detect, respond, recover, okay? Well, some problems related to this are, they don't differentiate between those or within them. They don't differentiate functions that directly versus indirectly affect risk. And if you don't understand those interactions and the difference between direct and indirect effect on risk, you're not, you're not going to be able to measure control value. You're not going to understand the problem clearly enough or deeply enough to make good measurements. It doesn't account for dependencies between controls as upstream, upstream and downstream effects, et cetera. Um, and it's not nearly granular enough. As you see, as we go along here in the, in the session, we'll see some much greater granularity. And, and again, there's it's not Jack being nerdy. That granularity is there because it had to be to capture really important subtleties and nuances or, or difference in units of measurement to account for how controls affect risk. Now, some of you who are familiar with 853 might say, hey, well, those controls talk about related controls. Mm, yes, they do, but they don't say anything about what their relationship is, how they're related to one another. Are they similar? Are they dependent on one another in one direction, both directions? Again, it doesn't go there. It doesn't get into the physiology. And then threat kill chains are interesting because it, it's scratching the surface of this notion of, of um, effects, right? The effects a control has on, on a loss event scenario but it's very tightly focused on that scenario. And it really doesn't talk about upstream and downstream effects and dependencies again. So it's, it's nibbling at the edges, but it's, it's, it's a long, long way from getting to the core of it. So in FairCam, we have um, a, a loss event model or a loss event control model of the, for the controls that directly affect the frequency or magnitude of loss. And for those of you who've, who've read the book I co-authored with Jack Freund a few years ago, chapter 11 there is about controls. And, and you'll see that some of this looks familiar to what's in that chapter. But unfortunately, that chapter was written in very early stages of my you know, work, my research around controls analytics. And even though it's directionally correct, um, it's profoundly incomplete. And there are a number of things I got wrong in there. So FairCam is in part a correction to that chapter, M much more completely fleshed out and tested and, and, and stands up and is actually useful. So at any rate, um, so we have our loss event controls, those that directly affect the frequency and magnitude of loss, and we'll see more of that in a second. And then we have decision controls and variance controls. And, and decision controls, and you'll see here that the, from the arrows in the diagram that decision controls affect decisions about loss and controls or variance controls or even other decision controls. And variance controls affect the reliability of loss and controls and decision controls and even other variance controls. So we have this, you know, complex interacted system or interconnected system of, of control elements. And, and the intent here is just to illustrate some of these relationships at a high level. So if we look at the loss event controls ontology, and, and 
uh, I need to point out, and I will point out again and again as we go through these, this is a partial ontology. The, the, the RSA conference program committee encouraged me to simplify my slides and, and, and pare back as much as I could without sort of losing the essence. So the ontologies I'm, I'm sharing today are, are just partial. They're not complete. Uh, that'll come um, later. So at any rate, here again, you see prevention, detection, and response, not rocket science, not new, until you look below that. And the model get, begins to be parsed out into more granularity so that we can make distinctions, really important distinctions between how different controls work. And very often these distinctions also mean that there are different units of measurement. So we see here under prevention, we have avoidance, deterrence, and resistance. Under detection, we have visibility and monitoring. And under response, we have resilience and loss reduction. So let's look at this in context, in the context of the loss event scenario. So in a, in a loss event, we have this chain of things that happen. Some threat actor affects assets, resulting in losses that have primary or secondary effects. Okay, And from a control perspective, we can prevent these from occurring to some degree, or we can mitigate their effects. So if we apply that loss event control ontology, we can see that avoidance control uh, reduces contact frequency with threat agents. And if you're familiar with FAIR, this will be old news to you. Um, if you're not familiar with FAIR, this, this may not be as clear to you. But the bottom line is here, avoidance controls help us to reduce the frequency or probability of contact with threat agents. Deterrence controls reduce the probability of action on their part if they do come into contact with an asset. And then resistive controls help us to resist their actions if in fact they try to act in a illicit uh, or malicious fashion. Then detection controls allow us to have timely response to all of this. Having, we need to have visibility into this and we need to be monitoring those logs, et cetera. Somebody has to be looking at them or they aren't really serving their purpose. And response controls, which reduce the loss magnitude. There's resilience if it's an outage event or loss of data, those sorts of things. That allows us to get back in, back in action sooner rather than later. And loss reduction allows us to recover some losses in some cases. And again, especially the loss magnitude side of what you're seeing here is incomplete. Um, but uh, uh, you know this would become even more of an eye chart if it was fully fleshed out. So the variance management controls has a, a similar ontology. And I did not parse this out into deeper layers of abstraction here. Again, simply to, to um, simplify the slides and because we just don't have enough time to go through all that, but, but they go to deeper levels of abstraction, but you can see sort of which controls begin to fit in which part of the ontology. And you may find that some controls actually exist in more than one element in the ontology or even across multiple ontologies. And, and that's simply because some technologies and some processes that we put into place do serve more than one risk management function or fulfill more than one risk management function, which is a good thing. But understanding, you know, the which functions it serves and how well it serves those functions. You know, if we don't understand that, that broader application of a control and, and, and fulfillment of its, of its purpose, then we can't measure its value. So again, we have to understand at these deeper levels of abstraction. And the same thing for decision support controls. And this is actually, uh, you won't see it here, but this is actually the most complex uh, part of the model. It goes to several layers of deeper uh, abstraction here than, than this. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's the part of the model that I think most people will be, um, will find uh, we've ignored or misunderstood as a profession. And you know things like risk appetite, how do they affect risk and, and policies? Are, and the risk measurement for that matter, um, being able to identify when decisions are misaligned with objectives and so on, and then how do we correct all that? So again, I apologize for <clears throat> not really having time to go into deeper detail here, 
but what I'm trying to do is really just open your eyes to the fact that this is, in my opinion, a pretty significant gap in our uh, in our knowledge base and and how we operate as a profession, and we need to close that. And so this is a heads up. And this presentation, this 40 minutes, is is meant to open open people's eyes to the fact that we've been missing controls physiology and we need to close that gap. And that's what FairCam is all about. So coming back to uh, this notion of value of a control, let's take anti-phishing training. Well, the purpose, reduced probability of people clicking on stuff they shouldn't click on, right? Um, the functional domain, back to the, you know, the loss of end controls, variance management controls, and decision support controls, which of those does this fit into? Most people, and in fact, me, in the beginning, I would have said, well, this is a loss of end control, or it's resistive. No. <laughs> the personnel who are looking at the email, they're the resistive control. This is variance management. This is making that control better. Okay, it's reducing the probability of failure of that control, that human control. And it does it by communicating policies and expectations and indicators of phishing and all that good stuff, right? That's how it actually operates. But it depends upon these other parts of the system, risk appetite policies, et cetera, and things I talked about before, threat intelligence. What do phishing attacks look like, right? Those have to be in place and working for this to function effectively. And if this isn't functioning effectively, then there are things downstream from a control perspective that suffer from that, right? Authentication and system security and those sorts of things. But fortunately, again, if this is deficient, there may be other controls in place that help to compensate for that to some degree. And, and again, if we want to understand, if we want to be able to to understand and put a number to, a real number, a real number, um, a value to anti-efficient training, we have to understand the system. We have to understand the physiology around it. Otherwise, whatever we put forth should not be considered reliable, right? We have to understand the rest of this. So here we see sort of a, a application of this in that, in that diagram I shared earlier. So the personnel's ability to recognize phishing, that's the loss of end control, okay? The, the human control in this case. And in order to understand the value, first thing we have to do is, is, is be explicit about what the context is for determining value. And it has to do with the loss event scenarios where that control is relevant. And maybe that's ransomware, or maybe it's a data breach or, or both, right? But we have to have that context in order to, um, to measure the value. But again, as I've said, we also have to understand the other controls that are in place that are also relevant to those scenarios, right? Because they share the load, so to speak, right? It isn't just anti-phishing training that's keeping us from, from falling you know, victim to the bad guys. It's these other things as well. And those things are dependent on these things and those things. And if we have a deficiency maybe down here in this part of the system, then that can affect the efficacy of controls elsewhere. Okay. So again, if we want to understand and measure and manage this part of the risk, the controls part of the risk landscape, we have to understand physiology. We have to. So wrapping this up then, um, you know, we as a profession have been focusing on anatomy and, and really leaving physiology to the intuition and experience of professionals. And, you know, there, there, I've encountered people in the profession who've been in, in this business for a long, long time and have developed a really good intuitive sense of, of sort of the systemic workings, okay? But this problem space is way more complex than, than I understood it to be before I got into, you know, really trying to dig into this dimension of it. And so unless, you know, unless there are people out there who just, their intuition is that much better than mine, which is certainly possible, but there aren't gonna be that many of them, at least that I've run across. And, and even then,
they may know it intuitively, but they can't draw it out and explain it consistently or clearly. They can't share that understanding with others. And most of the people in our profession haven't been around long enough yet to develop those instincts and those intuitions and that understanding. So as a, as a result, again, without formally documenting and, and researching and proving out this controls physiology dimension, the odds of, of getting it wrong are really, really high. And I see all kinds of evidence of that right and left. As, as I've looked at controls physiology and then look at breach scenario, you know, the breaches that have occurred, and I can begin to look at sort of as, as I see description of the things that weren't in raw, that weren't in place or that weren't working well within an organization, I'm going, okay, you know, here's a connection, there's a connection, there's a connection, right? We have to understand anatomy and physiology. And again, as I've said, we've just been focusing on anatomy um, and FairCam is trying to fill that gap. And imagine, you know, if you will, how empowering it would be to know which controls really deserve and warrant additional investment and which ones we can deprioritize or retire altogether so that we are, you know, we're able to be far more cost-effective in how we do what we do. You know, that's when we begin, in my view, to, to really prove out the, the value that we have as a profession to our organizations. So more to come on this, uh, a white paper, I, I'm God willing, will publish a white paper in mid-October that will have the complete ontologies. It'll go into great and gory detail about control efficacy, how it's defined and measured. Uh, it'll go into detail about the many really interesting nuances and factors that affect control efficacy. Again, many of which we do not deal with uh, explicitly or very effectively as a profession today. Uh, it talks, it'll show that defense in depth can be measured in four or five different ways, uh, distinctly different ways, all of which are valid and important. And if we want to leverage defense in depth, we need to know these things. Um, it also has to account for human behavior because hey, as long as humans are involved, uh, human behavior affects control efficacy. So again, the model or this paper will describe how this model, how this framework uh, accounts for that. And then of course, it'll also get into mapping of, of the different control frameworks that we have today to FairCam and um, more on that in a minute. Oh, by the way, just FYI, general membership in the Fair Institute is currently free. So I'm just saying. So beginning this week, please, please, please recognize that the value of any control boils down to how much it affects risk, directly or indirectly, okay? Uh, if, if a control doesn't affect risk, then why are we doing it? Why are we spending any money, time or effort on it, okay? Um, begin to think about controls as this highly interconnected system of, of parts. Um, because if we don't have this systemic view, then we're really missing the picture. And then become a member of the Fair Institute, please. Uh, within the next three months, um, start beginning, you know, look at the controls that you have in place where you work and, and begin thinking about, you know, are they, um, uh, what are they dependent upon and what depends upon them? Begin to build in your own mind an understanding of these dependencies, both upstream and downstream. And keep in mind that many controls serve more than one physiological, physiological function. For example, uh, anti-malware technologies tend to serve, they're like a little Swiss army knife of control functions. You know, everything from resistance to detection to, to, well, resistance, visibility, monitoring, uh, containment um, from loss event controls, and then from variance management controls, they provide visibility and correct or identify the support identification and correction. So again, 
you know, as you're thinking about controls, don't be surprised if you're looking at a say a technology or, or or control function and you're saying, but that serves more than one purpose. Well, that's a good thing. Okay. And then yeah, I know some of you are likely to go charging out and try to begin mapping, you know, you know whatever control framework you're using today to what I've shared. And I, I just want to give you a heads up. It's going to be really challenging and frustrating and painful because the control frameworks that we have today were never defined for, you know, to account for this physiological dimension. And so very, very often many of those controls, these control descriptions in those are munging different control functions together. And so mapping is really messy and difficult and, and frustrating. Um, now, I, I have almost completed mapping the CIS top 20, which is really 171 controls to uh, FairCam. And about 85% of them mapped cleanly, relatively cleanly and easily to FairCam. The other 15%, you know, um, can't really be mapped. Uh, simply because it's munging too many things together and, and, and that control description can map to a bunch of different things in, in FairCam. And, and that's problematic from a measurement perspective. So just heads up. Uh, when you're looking at deficient controls, say there's an audit finding or something, think about, again, whether it's affecting risk directly or indirectly. Is it affecting reliability of controls or decisions regarding controls, these sorts of things? and think about upstream and downstream dependencies. And then in six months, I would like to think you'd want to download and, and read the, the paper and hopefully you'll find that uh, enlightening and, and that it answers many of the questions that you might have right now. And begin talking about this to your colleagues and such and, and just raising this idea that there's this whole di other dimension to controls that we need to start paying attention to. So that is, um, that is what I have to share today. I hope you found it interesting and helpful. And uh, I look forward to answering questions. Thank you.